So today is September 29, 2024. We're here with Sister Janet Machula White of the Globe Second Ward, um, who's going to be speaking uh, to us about uh, many of her experiences here in the Globe Stake. We're going to start this video uh, interview off a little bit differently. Sister Machula White has uh, written and uh, both lyrics and the music to to many different songs, and we've asked her if she would share one of her songs with us. Uh, Sister Machula, what uh, what song have you chosen? This song is called Heaven's Angels. Okay. And it was actually written for a choir, and I'm just singing it as a solo, so it'll be a little different. Okay. about the song? Well, I wrote a series of songs for the Center for the Arts for them to perform for each of their Christmas programs for about seven years before Paul passed away. And this was the final song called Heaven's Angels. I, I just wanted to be in touch with what it would be like for Paul when he goes to heaven. And so I wrote this song that he would be surrounded by heaven's angels. Oh, so, that's what happened. 
All right, so tell us, well, tell us who Paul is. Oh, Paul is the one I married um, first. He was my first husband for 40 years. And he was actually um, born in Snowflake and then moved to Globe when he was just a couple months old. But um, I'm wondering if I should start with my life first and then talk about him. Okay, we can do that. Well, tell us, so you, you have a very fascinating background. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, uh, where you were raised, what that was like, family life, that type of thing? So my, my early years were quite a bit different from a usual child growing up in the United States because I was born and raised in India. My parents were missionaries there for the Methodist Church, and they, of course, did proselyting, um, but my father also worked in the villages with my mother in health care, and he also ran a school for children who would have no education. So there's many um, facets of being a missionary in a foreign country. And I, as well as my siblings, went to a boarding school up in the Himalayan mountains. And um, that was a little rough, being kind of torn away from family life at a very young age and having to be um, in boarding school. I remember those first years were, were a little hard being separated from family. So uh, the boarding school was in the Himalayan mountains, or by the Himalayan mountains? It was about 7,000 feet. How far away were you from your parents? Where were they? They were on the plains of India in the Punjab, and um, that's in northern India. And I was up in um, Missouri. Um, which is in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, but we could see the everlasting snows from there, which was really beautiful. How often did you get to see your parents when you were in boarding school? Um, my mother would come up and visit us for a couple months out of the year, and we'd get to see her and stay with her. She would take us out of boarding school for a little while before she'd go back to the plains to be with my father. So, so, what was uh, what what was it like, or what, what do you remember? Uh, I, it's probably t I'm thinking probably too big of a question, but um, what what experiences from your uh, growing up in India uh, do you? Uh, that have affected you the most, do you think? I think that um, just being with the, the native Indian children, I learned how to speak Hindustani pretty fluently, and my parents really couldn't tell who was talking if I was in another room with a friend. Um, I lost some of that when I came back to the States, and I'm not as fluent anymore as I used to be. But... Um, one of the things that was really challenging to me was visiting a Hindu temple and seeing people doing puja or worshiping idols. And I wanted to just yell at them and tell them, that's wrong because Jesus is Lord and you should be worshiping him. But I realized at a young age that you can't talk like that to people um, because this is so ingrained, this is the way they've been taught and the way they've grown up. And um, we teach our faith through love and not through harsh words. So that's one thing I learned from studying the different religions in India. What uh, Are there other things about India that have stayed with you all these years? Well, I really do miss the Himalayan mountains, but I'm glad that we have the Pinals here. Um, 
they're not quite as high not in the 29,000 foot range um, but I do remember walking home from school to get to um, boarding school which was down the hill from the actual school and um, there'd be langur monkeys up in the trees and they would throw acorns at me on my way home and one time our family had a picnic up in the the mountains and the monkeys came and jumped down on our food and stole stole our sandwiches he ran off with them so um they they could be little rascals the monkeys could another time um a snake charmer brought a cobra up to our porch and was having this cobra um, do kind of like a swaying movement to his flute and the cobra got out of its container and my little brother who was just three years old at the time was very close to that cobra my mother just swept him up in her arms and saved his life because that snake could have bit him so there were some pretty scary things that happened over there. So, how old were you when you left India? I was 18. So, I came back to the United States for my college education. And it was, um, my biggest interest was music therapy. So, I found a school, Kansas University, um, offered me the degree in music therapy, so that's where I went. And um, at the time, I'll just share my conversion story from there. Uh, I was attending the church which my parents would have wanted me to go to, the Methodist Church on campus. And the minister there happened to be a, a humanitarian philosopher. He really didn't preach that much about Christ at all. And so that kind of was confounding to me. Uh, one day I asked him, I just said, um, do you believe in Christ? And he just kind of hemmed and hawed about it. And I said, well, let's put it this way. Do you believe in Christ's miracles? And he said, not really. And that just kind of shocked me. I said, I thought, why are you being a minister if you don't even believe that Jesus performed miracles? And uh, he couldn't answer that question. He just felt like life wasn't very fair. Why would Jesus perform miracles for some people and let others die? And so I thought, I, I need to find a church that really believes in Jesus and his teachings. And I had already studied all the religions of the world. I'd studied all about the Hindu faith and Muslim and Buddha, um, so many different religions, the Sikhs. And I realized as I pondered all of them that uh, Christ, the life of Christ was far superior to any other religious leader that ever lived in this world. So I needed to find the true church. And on campus, there happened to be a group of really forthright young people that lived by their standards and their values. And I found out that they were Mormons. I thought, oh, <laughs> uh, I think Mormons are kind of weird. So I wasn't really too um, interested in going to church with them they offered to take me anyway and i went to the very first lds service and that happened to be a testimony meeting and there were quite a few little young children who got up and bore their testimonies about how much they loved jesus and how much they loved their families and heavenly father and the tears just started streaming down my face. I was so touched by their testimonies. I felt like in my whole life, I had never felt that kind of spirit ever before. 
So, of course, I had to start investigating and took the missionary lessons. And it took me a while to roll around because I didn't really want to hurt my parents by joining another church. But I finally got enough nerve to call them and tell them that I really had plans to be baptized in the LDS Church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And my dad just thought it was a passing fancy. He, he thought, well, she's gone through a lot of different phases in her life with, you know, studying all these different religions, and, and this just won't last very long. So they were fine with it. They said, yeah, go ahead. You can get baptized. It's okay with us. Well, they didn't realize, lo and behold, that all these many years later, I would still be a Mormon or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So that's how I became a Mormon. And I know I'm not supposed to say Mormon, but that's the word they used to refer to it as. So I'm still a member of the Church. And once I joined the Church, I thought, oh, I really want to find out what it's like to go to the church's most wonderful campus of all, BYU. So I got accepted at BYU after I graduated from Kansas University in music therapy, and I thought, you know, I want to do something else besides just music. So I enrolled and got certified in elementary and special education. And it was at BYU that you probably want to hear about how I met. Paul. So tell us about that. How did you how did you meet your husband? So we were in the same branch at BYU. And I noticed that he was quite an excellent piano player. So I crossed him off my list of um, potential people to date because I thought, oh, this will never work to have two musicians vying for who's better than who. And um decided, no, I would not be interested in dating him. But then he found out that I played the sitar from India. And that kind of piqued his interest because he was very interested in folk music. So that's how uh, we got acquainted and started dating. And pretty soon things rolled around and we ended up getting married in the, the Mesa Temple. So that was quite a wonderful experience, except that my parents could not attend, and how, that was hard. How did they react to that? They came. They were there, but my mother had tears in her eyes because she couldn't enter the temple. Back in those days, they allowed us to do our ring exchange in the garden, and uh, I was able to ask my father to give the closing prayer which was really special because he had performed the, the wedding ceremony for my siblings. I was the only child he couldn't do that for, but um, they were happy to be there and to be able to participate a little bit. Now, that must have been hot in the garden. Oh, <laughs> July 3rd of 1976 was very hot, the closest day we could get to the bicentennial. So, um, when you got married, were you still both students at BYU? Um, yes. Paul actually finished his degree in 1979 as for his master's degree in music. And um, I was just finishing up my um, certification program for elementary and special ed. And so, we finished that up and then came to GLOBE. So what did you think of GLOBE when you came to GLOBE? Uh, I was really happy to find some place that I could maybe call home because I had moved so much in my lifetime. I said, Paul, I'm never moving again. And I've been here ever since. And I was thrilled to have the Pinal Mountains in the backyard to have somewhere that I could go hiking, just like in the in the Himalayan mountains. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. 
So um, I'm wondering if you might be able to tell us a little bit about Paul's background. Uh, Paul passed away uh, several years ago. Uh, it'd be nice to have him tell a little bit about his background, but he's, he's certainly done a lot in the state and in his ward. Can you tell us a little bit about Paul's story? So Paul actually passed away in December 10th of 2015. So it's been a number of years that he's been gone and I have remarried. Um, my husband now is Irby White. And the interesting thing is that when Paul was, was bishop of the Globe Second Ward, that Irby was his financial clerk. And um, Paul was very uh, amazed and impressed with his computer skills. So I ended up getting married to his financial clerk. Now back to Paul, when, uh, when he was little, he moved from Snowflake where he was born to Globe where his father set up a watch repair shop. And um, there were three siblings. He had a little sister and he had another brother. But the tragedy happened when there was a terrible flood in December of um, 1951 was actually the, da the last day of December. And Paul and his little sister, who was three years old, he was four, went down to the creek to see the floodwaters. And Vicki fell in. She was swept away. And they didn't retrieve her or find her till her body was at the other end of town. And this tragedy affected Paul for the rest of his life and into the next generation. It was very, very difficult for him to overcome because he was right there when it happened. But um, he did have some other things that were kind of fun in his childhood. He had an older brother who taught him about being cowboy and um, riding horses, and he loved that, although one time he got knocked off a horse and uh, suffered a concussion from that. But fortunately, his brains recovered from that. Um, when he was 14 and his younger brother was 11, they traveled all the way to Salt Lake City all by themselves without parents so that they could do genealogy in uh, Temple Square. And it was just amazing that those two boys checked into a hotel and stayed there all by themselves, got their genealogy done, and went all the way back home without any parental supervision. How did, how did they get there? They took a bus. So it was quite an amazing trip. Um, another time he was with a, a friend from high school, Bill Tomey. They built themselves a canoe and decided to take this canoe out into the Pacific Ocean. So they drove all the way over there with this canoe and put it into the ocean, never realizing how dangerous that can be with the large waves. Well, the ocean claimed the canoe they were not able to recover that, but their lives were spared. So he got to grow up. <laughs> um, Paul graduated as, as salutatorian from his Globe High School class in 1965. And then he decided to go on a mission in 1967. And he was sent by the church to northern Argentina where he served for two years. And his first companion was Mark McConkey, son of Bruce R. McConkey. And his second companion 
was Clark Hinckley, son of Gordon B. Hinckley, and his mission president was Richard G. Scott from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And Paul learned so much from him. He just, his testimony just grew by leaps and bounds from being around these wonderful people. Um, he decided after his mission to go to ASU. And he graduated from ASU in 1973 with degrees in music education and also minor in Spanish. And then he decided he wanted to be in the Arizona National Guard. So he served in the Guard for 10 years, from 71 till 81, 1981. And the amazing thing about it was he was assigned to a helicopter unit as a mechanic. And Paul had absolutely no training in this area. He had to read the manuals very meticulously in order to make certain that the helicopters could get off the ground and stay in the air and then land safely. Well, while he was in the guard, he also received an award for having the very best markmanship in his entire unit. So after completing his undergraduate work, he did go to BYU, and I told you about him um, meeting me there. And he completed his master's degree in 1979. So we both were able to get de um, jobs in the Miami School District. I got a position in special ed with learning disabled students, and Paul became the music teacher of the elementary for 22 years. And then after that, he switched to Spanish and French in the high school and served 14 years there and was teacher of the year a couple of times for both music and for Spanish. So we ended up having three daughters who are absolutely wonderful, Amy, Laurel, and Hyla. And um, we, as a family, did so much performing together. I would kid my children when they were growing up. I said, you can't live here unless you know how to sing and play the piano. This is the singing house. And so they, <clears throat> they all had to excel in their, on their instruments. And we performed together a lot in the community. Um, I wanted to share with you a couple of the callings that that um, Paul had that really made it, had an influence on his life. He was a ward and state clerk, state clerk for both President Watts and President Wolf. Um, he he was state music chairman for a while. He served on the high council and was ward mission leader, ward financial clerk. Uh, gospel doctrine teacher, and two of the things that really impressed him very much were serving in the branch presidency in San Carlos with President Dalton, and also in Superior with President Chambers. He felt like they were both very, very spiritual people that he learned a lot from them. And then he also served as Bishop of the Globe Second Ward for five years, between 1999 and 2004. So one thing I'm very thankful for is that all three of my daughters found our sons-in-law to take them to the temple and be sealed. And they're still active in the church, so I'm very, very grateful for that. I <clears throat> also wanted to let you know about um, some of the subjects that 
Paul was extremely interested in. He loved astronomy. He could tell you about the stars and the constellations and taught his girls all about them. He also taught them how to tune pianos. And he loved history. He made all of his students in his Spanish classes and French classes learn about the history of the countries that he was telling them about, not just developing their language skills, but learning their history too. And they were so fascinated with him. He loved computer programming, and he also wrote many, many, many compositions. And he uh, was in both the Globe Miami Centennial Band and Jazz Band, and he blessed a lot of people with his music. Another really amazing thing that he did was to have a sundial garden in which he constructed six different types of sundials. Each was unique and had amazing calculations and accuracy. And over one of them, he wrote the words in Latin, Ecce venit sol, here comes the sun, because he kind of measured time by the sun. Another thing that's really quite amazing about Paul is that he wrote a lot of historical books about this area. And uh, one of them is called the Panal Mountain Legacies, and another one is called The Tale of the Apache Kid. And he also wrote The History of the San Carlos Apache, which he co-authored with Dale Miles. He did some historical presentations as part of the Arizona Lecture Series in Apache Junction, and that was to an audience of over 400 people. And he designed a website for the Hill County Historical Museum as well. Um, in 1990, he received the first place for the LDS Church Worldwide Music Competition for his Christmas anthem, and that was entitled Wondrous Child. A lot of people that have heard that song were really touched by it. It was so beautiful. So... I don't know if there are any other things that you want to know about my life or Paul's. Um, well, I can I ask you some questions? Sure. So, um, both you and Paul um, wrote and, and composed. You mentioned that uh, you first marked him off your list because you thought two piano players in the same family. Um, were the two, uh, did the two of you collaborate at all as you're writing? Did you bounce ideas off of each other? How, how did that work? Oh, all the time. We were constantly collaborating and a lot of times I would write something down and I'd ask Paul about whether he thought it was um, correctly notated or whether I should change some voicings for a choir. And he was extremely helpful to me about that. So I know that my abilities as a composer increased because of his knowledge and his help. Now, both of you have done an awful lot with music in the community and in the church. Uh, can you talk about some of the uh, um, things that have happened with music in, in the stake over the years that, that maybe you and Paul were involved with? I know that um, we used to be involved with every single Christmas thing that ever came along. Our family was always performing in one of those, and a lot of times he would write an original composition. One year I remember he... He used the organ. We all dressed up in Lithuanian costume because his ancestry was from Lithuania. And uh, we performed a piece of music that was in the style of Lithuanian and written in the Lithuanian language. And that was really quite a highlight. 
So as you mentioned that, what's coming to my mind, and I'll let you correct and add to this, but I recall once we had a state music chairman, chairperson, who um, about the time of the Christmas scene said, I want a new Christmas song. I want it to be kind of in a Mediterranean style. And I can't share a couple of other qualifications. And she came to Paul and with that request, and he did that. Do you, re um, do you recall what I'm, the, I don't recall the name of the song, but do you recall this incident? That might have been the one that we did from Lithuania. Um, I'm not sure of any other that was actual Mediterranean. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that's Sister Dodge. Yeah, she's the one that asked us to do the Lithuanian number. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the stake was created in 1974, so that was just a couple of years before you got married uh, here in Mesa. Um, so you have lived uh, almost during the entire 50 years of the stake here. You came here just a little bit after that. What type, are there certain uh, stake activities or things that ha have happened in the stake over the years that, uh, that uh, have been impactful to you? Uh, I remember that um, at one point I was the, the stake cultural arts specialist and I got a group of girls together to sing and um, I believe Laurel was playing the violin for them as a desk cat, and I had them singing parts, and that was really, really fun to have them do that. So you have mentioned that, that you uh, raised three daughters here in the state. What was it like uh, to you uh, raising a family here in the church in, uh, in Globe? I really appreciated all the community support that we received, the enthusiasm from people who, who loved to hear our family perform together and who supported um, our musical endeavors. So I felt like this was a great place to raise the kids because we had some very good music programs back in the day. And um, we had good teachers here too, I felt. So my, my children, I think, benefited from growing up here in Globe. So um, are there uh, You, you've mentioned a little bit about uh, also being involved in the community with different things. Uh, often in the church, we'll talk about the need to be involved in the community. And, and you and Paul definitely were people who actually uh, didn't just get that lip service. You did that. Um, wh why, why were you willing to volunteer so much in different things in the community? I felt like it was a great way to share our testimony with the world. And I have really enjoyed playing for uh, Martha Chambers for her music programs at the schools. And she always includes in her programs some type of a religious song. And I think that touches the hearts of the children to, to be able to um, maybe get a little bit of taste of Heavenly Father's love for them, even if they don't get that from their, their own home. Um, also, being the secretary for the Friends of the Globe Public Library, um, I think has been a great opportunity to um, share my love for reading and my love for books with the community and helping 
the children to um, have more opportunities with with um, good reading material from that. And then the community concert board, we bring in all kinds of great music for the community that way. So uh, I felt like it's really important to be involved in the community. So, um, would you like to comment any more about any service, about service opportunities that you've had over the years in the stake and, and or the Paulus had? Um, I just feel like all the callings that I've served with in the church have helped me to grow spiritually because I've had callings in primary as primary president, um, ward uh, music chairman, um, all kinds of programs with ward choir and organ. Um, I was a counselor in the young women's program for a while. I've taught gospel doctrine class with Paul. Uh, I've taught Relief Society lessons. And I think my most favorite callings of all have been with the nursery and, and with the primary, being with the children. That's what I love the most. One of the questions that I've been asking uh, people during these interviews is, have you or your family been the recipient of significant acts of service? Are there any um, acts of service that, uh, that you'd like to talk about that you've, you and your family have benefited from? Um, during Paul's illness with cancer, I was quite overwhelmed at times, both with, with grief and just the challenge of being a caregiver for nine and a half years. It was, it was very difficult. But there were people in our ward who were always reaching out to us. Um, I know that um, President, President Chambers and Martha were were wonderful in helping us in so many ways. Um, my own children, Hyla, Laurel, and Amy, took turns staying up with their dad when he was in hospice care, so he would have 24-hour care, as well as Jesus Rivas and my son-in-law, Nathan Klein, who helped to take care of him because he did not want to be in the nursing home. So, so we just took care of him at home. And Bishop Layton came over and helped us a lot. When, um, and I would say Calvin and Jody Mikeworth were absolutely wonderful, great helpers. Um, when Paul was going through chemotherapy down in the valley, there were times where he had to have follow up treatments one day after another. And Jim and Phyllis Watts opened their home to us so that we'd have a place to stay. And they were also wonderful. So I just have a heart full of gratitude to all those who who have helped us. Lisa Brown brought over meals, and so did so many other sisters in the Relief Society. Every time Paul had surgery, they would be there helping. Jane Flake, so many others. So, during uh, these uh, Bob State 50th anniversary videos, um, the narrator seldom says much, but um, I'd like to break that rule here a little bit to talk a little, a little bit about uh, uh, Paul and just, uh, and I also have never acknowledged who I am in any of these videos yet. So I'm Brian Chambers, uh, uh, counselor in the state presidency. But uh, I had several opportunities to serve with Paul Machula. And what a great uh, uh, experience that was every single time. Um, 
for a little bit of time, I, you know, I got to serve in the, in the uh, as a state executive secretary, and he was the state clerk. And he he uh, he had institutional knowledge that no one else had. He, uh, growing up here in the in the Globe Stake, he knew just about everything that there had ever happened in the Globe Stake. It seemed. He, um, and he was such a deep person intellectually. Um, it was, I felt like I learned and learned and learned, um, being, um, uh, able to serve with him and listen to him when, uh, when we served in superior, um, he would, uh, he would come out, uh, I was serving, uh, as branch presidency. The key high priest group leader. I'm not ex exactly sure, but we'd go out early in in the morning for early meetings, and I would I pick him up, take him, and then uh, um, then he then uh, on the way back, uh, uh, I think he'd go back with with Martha and. Uh, and I, I can remember, so on the way down every time we'd go, I always, I felt like I was getting a graduate level class and whatever he was talking about at, at the time. And it was just fascinating to listen to him. Um, he knew so much about uh, so many things. I, the type of person you could just sit and listen to and hours could pass and you'd, you'd, you'd want more. Um, and uh, one great opportunity I had was to serve as his counselor when he was the Bishop of the Globe Second Ward. Um, again, what a deep and loving man. He really, he cared about the Lord greatly. Um, hundred percent committed to the gospel. Uh, and I learned so, so much from him. So I apologize for kind of breaking the rule on these interviews, but I just wanted to say that about him. Um, he's been one of the great influences of my life. So, I, again, I apologize for interrupting <laughs> in your, your video, but um, let me ask this. As we've gone through this interview, are there things that you've thought of that, that uh, maybe we didn't talk about before we started the, the videotape? Anything you'd like to, else that you'd like to share? Um, there was one experience I had at BYU that I would like to let you know about. Um, when I was in the branch there, our branch had a unique experience of going up and visiting with the apostles of the church. Um, just briefly, in between conference sessions, we were allowed to take them cookies and homemade goodies, which I know that's not allowed anymore. Um, but I got to, I was privileged enough to go with that group, and I actually got to meet President Kimball in the hallway, the tunnel that, that attaches from the tabernacle to their offices. And he had the warmest handshake I have ever felt in my whole life. And it just thrilled me to be able to shake his hand. I was so inspired by that. And I'll never forget it. Was he the prophet at that time? Yes. Wow. He was the prophet. So I just felt like um, he was filling me with spirit when I shook his hand. He was so strong. So you mentioned at the beginning of the interview that your your parents thought that joining the church would just be this passing fad. Did now and, and they both passed on now. Yes. Have did they ever did they come to a point where they realized it wasn't just a fad? Yes. How long um, do you think that took? Several years. My mother actually came to one of our testimony meetings one time, and she told me, this was after my father had passed away, and she said, 
I am so grateful that my daughter is a member of such a wonderful church. And that's coming from someone who had dedicated her entire life to the ministry in the Methodist church. So that was saying a lot. How did you feel when she said that? I just beamed. I was very thankful, happy that she had that realization. So, um, and it, uh, do you think your dad felt the same way? I, in some ways, yes. I think it might have been a little harder for him, but, but he, he totally understood the depth of my commitment. What did they think of Paul? They thought he was awesome. They loved him as their own son. Oh. Well, I guess two things. Um, one, if there's anything else that maybe you've been inspired to say, now would be a good time to do it. And two, would you, we invite you to uh, leave uh, a brief testimony with us. Sure. Um, I'd like to share something that Paul wrote back in 2014. The senior class at Miami High School asked Paul to be a speaker at their baccalaureate service. And he ended his message with these words. Our lives are truly of inestimable worth. The virtues within us are eternal. In that perspective, there are no endings. There are only beginnings. And I'll end with my testimony that in spite of this very, very difficult tragedy that I went through in losing my wonderful husband, I know that life goes on that Heavenly Father has a plan for us to be united together for eternity with our families, and I'm so grateful for that plan. I'm so thankful for my testimony in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm grateful that I've been able to serve in this wonderful gospel. I'm thankful for our Savior and for our prophet, for all of our leaders. And I pray that we will always be receptive to the Holy Spirit. I leave these words with you in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Sister Matula White, uh, for sharing all these thoughts and feelings with us. And thank you for all the, uh, the wonderful service that you have done over the years and Paul has done. Um, you've blessed many people's lives.